Bri Larson divides the internet with the controversial question about hot dogs. Ms. Larson has sparked a heated debate among online foodies who are trying to decide whether or not a hot dog is a sandwich. Bri, love, come on over to my place and I will show you the biggest hot dog you've ever seen. <laughs> Samuel L. Bronkowitz presents Linda Chambers recreating her classic role. <gasps> Do you mind? This is an internal call. Show me your nuts. Oh, oh, oh. oh I know one. I'm your babe. It's Friday, ladies and gentlemen, and you know what that means. The more terrible wokey dokey takes of the week brought to you by yours truly. And on today's cringe apocalypse podcast, Russell Brand and the fake sad face, Frasier making a return after all these years, and the Marvels, Nia DeCosta, the director behind that awful film starring Brie Larson and Iman Vellani has more reveals that tell us this film is going to sink to the bottom of the ocean which even the plankton will dare not to touch so on that one ladies and gentlemen sit back strap in and get ready for a funky ride I do need to get myself a Leo Sayo Afro wig. If anybody's got one, then send it to me at the details below. <laughs> the following program contains naughty bits. But before each naughty bit comes on the screen, you'll hear this warning sound. Woke! Woke! Hotter than this! And more exciting than this. Yes, friends, Thames Television brings you the test card. Hey, man, now, and welcome to Trisha on the road. Me be like the Nicholas Ho. And here we go, ladies and gentlemen, with the first story of the week. Of course, how did this week actually begin? Quite insane, actually. The whole Russell Brand debacle. Now, listen, I have said in the previous video, it was actually for one piece of all things, that I'm not the biggest fan of this man. I never have been. I know people were drawn to him because he looked quirky. He was quite a good-looking individual, but behind that veneer was something more deep dark and disturbing so i've seen the dispatches channel 4 documentary and i will say the worst aspect of that hour and a half episode was the woman called alice um who talked about after she slept with brand what he did to her afterwards nothing involving anything of any of a sexual nature it was actually a lot more disgusting and unfortunately, it kept bringing up images in my head about him doing these alleged things to the poor woman. So, you know, this photograph here on The Verge where Russell is, uh, you know, he's got a prepared speech because, you know, the day after this atomic bomb was going to explode on the internet and explode, it certainly did. And, you know, the, the ravages of drugs and abuse and everything else. So YouTube, and I predicted this, I didn't say it, but I, I predicted it. They have, they have actually demonetized Mr. Brand's YouTube channel. The guy's got a lot of followers on there because he changed his niche from just talking about general things to conspiracy theories. And of course, people are drawn to that. So am I. But if I want conspiracy theories, I won't go to Russell Brand to get my answers. I can go to my local Tesco's and meet a random crazy woman there who will tell me everything I need to know. And I don't have to pay her for the privilege. So YouTube has blocked Russell Brand from making money off the ad revenue from his videos. Apparently, he makes like a million a year from the ad revenue. So um, because of the allegations against him, that's why they're doing it. Which to me sounds a little bit hypocritical from YouTube because any creator on that platform can have misgivings outside of that 
platform of theirs. But if it somehow demoralizes YouTube, oh my, in the name of morality, they're going to demonetize you, which is not the end of the world. They're not taking you off the platform. It just means you can't make the Wonga, which is interesting because the alternative platform uh, for YT is Rumble. Now, what's very interesting, Rumble has said on Twitter that uh, they're not going to demonetize Mr. Brand because they received a what they call a disturbing letter from UK Parliament. Yeah, now while Rumble actually deplores allegations of abuse and everything else, it believes that both the alleged victims and the accused are entitled to a full and serious investigation. And it's vital that the recent allegations against Russell Brand have nothing to do with what he talks about on Rumble, which I guess is a fair point. So he's going to continue to make money off there. But you know what? I, I've got to kind of give a, a bit of a hot, spicy take on the whole debacle that is Mr. Brand. So when he worked for the BBC back in 2007, uh, look, I worked for Radio Luxembourg um, in the uh, very, uh, well, 1990 to 91 before it sadly closed down. And my former radio programming boss, uh, the late, great Jeff Graham, um, he would pull me aside and tell me stories about Jimmy Savile. Okay, that's miscreant of society. Um, he even told me a story that Savile would go to a hospital and have fun with the cadavers. And I never knew what that meant. And, I, and then suddenly I just realized what it meant. You know, there's the N word. And I mean, not that N word. And uh, yeah, it's I just sat there thinking, have I just walked into the asylum of Arkham City? It was just the weirdest thing. And of course, now, if Brand is in radio as he was then, are you telling me he doesn't know? the reputation of Jimmy Savile. For crying out loud, when I worked at Radio Top Shop, there was an infamous cassette tape going around uh, and it was referred to as the bastard tape. Now, when you first hear it, there's not much that that gleams alarmability to you. You know, you will play it and you think, oh, what's this all about? Why are they mocking certain DJs? So for example, Paul Gambaccini is Paul Wank Me Quickly. And uh, there was an impression of Jimmy Savile that came up and it's like, now then, now then, little girl. Ooh. And uh, <laughs> you'd be surprised and shocked to learn that the man who voiced all those impressions was none other than famous hypnotherapist himself, Paul McKenna, an ex-Capital Radio DJ. He put it together, this tape. It's very funny. I used to have a copy of it, and I no longer have it. It's such a shame. So, yeah, all, all that stuff was prevailing. The BBC knew for years what Savile's reputation is like, but when you get a numbnuts like Russell Brandt, who endorses Savile, I mean, if they find his grave, go and piss on it, go and shit on it. It deserves all the... Uh, desecration it can get but have a quick listen to this clip which by the way was actually centered on the uh, dispatches uh, documentary I, re I remember now i just next was... time next time put a stamps envelope in oh i mean i could just ask you now if you could are you going to be doing any more fixes for anyone <laughs> Of course, I should be doing fixes long after you're dead. <laughs> I, I believe that to be true. It'd be very nice to meet you one day, Mr. Jimmy Savile, just, well, you know. if you've got a sister, you could meet me by bringing her along. I, I mean, I haven't got any sisters, I but... I don't usually meet fellas, but if you've got a sister, that's okay. I've got a personal assistant called Marsha, and part of her job description is that anyone I demand she um, greets, meets, massages, she has to do it. She's very attractive, Jimmy. Well, that's 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 a good start. R what a kind good of start? You could send her along to do some research. Would you like her to wear anything in in particular, Sir Jimmy? <laughs> I'd actually prefer her to wear nothing. Right. So you want Marsha, my assistant, to meet you naked? Okay. Well, that's that's not going to be that's not going to be a problem. Yeah, well, that's aged really well, hasn't it? <laughs> Listen, I'm all for cheeky humour. But of course, when you play this back now, it sounds incredibly dated, absolutely cringe. And while Russell Brand sits on his platform doing the forlorn face, looking sorry, and you know, a guy like him who says he's into Buddhism and he's found a new uh, creative outlet in terms of being spiritual. But to me, you're just doing that to mask your previous endeavors. Richard Pryor, there's a dude. now. 
Russell Brand says that when he was a teenager, his father took him to Thailand and to uh, prostitutes and made him have their wicked way with him. Uh, Richard Pryor, that guy, you know, for me, Richard Pryor, Russell Brand is going to be Pryor all day long. Pryor was also born above a brothel ran by his grandmother. And okay, how did he turn out? One of the funniest, probably the funniest man of his generation. So much so, Bill Cosby was saying to him, you got to do the king comedy, man. What's all this cursing and stuff? Because, of course, we know what Bill Cosby was hiding even back then. And, of course, Richard Pryor gave Cosby the mid two middle fingers and just did his own thing. And, yes, Pryor certainly had his uh, transgressions into certain aspects of sexuality that I didn't even realize until I did some research about it yesterday. But if Richard Pryor was alive today and he was caught up in the midst of all of this stuff, uh, and from what I remember, Richard Pryor was never me too by women. I think, you know, despite his addictions with drugs and alcohol and smoking and everything else, uh, he was quite a, um, a reserved guy off stage and off screen. But if he was around today and this all happened to him, the guy would just say, fuck it, I'm just going to sit down and smoke a joint and have a beer. And unfortunately, the more that brand goes out there and uh, tells everybody, look, I'm not a predator, I'm not this and not that, it just makes him look worse. So all I'll say is in the realms of spirituality, Mr. Brand, karma is a bitch and it is coming for you big time. Then the police came, <laughs> I went in the house. Because they got magnums too. And they don't kill cars. They kill niggas. All right, so in other news today, I couldn't even believe this is a thing now. Oh, baby, you hear those blues are calling. Toss salad and scrambled eggs. My, oh, my. So, Frasier 2023 is making a comeback. And um, this quick clip here reminds me a bit of Friends, Central Perk. Uh, the minute I saw this clip, you know what I'm going to say, right? And I'm, and I'm going to say it. Lady here in the red is just like forced ESG already. <laughs> and, she, well, who is this gentleman, by the way? Where, where is Niles Crane? Why is David Hyde Pierce not returning to reprise his role? Well, I'll get to that point in a minute, but I'll play this quick clip, and it's on Paramount. Sitting here with a cold brew in my hand, I feel amalgamated with the hoi polloi. You are the classic everyman. Yes, it's Rodders from Only Fools of the Horses. Now, good for Nicholas Lyndhurst that he's got this role. Uh, and, you know, the guy's had some personal tragedy in his own life, which is really sad. And he's a bit of a national treasure. So for him to land this while he's still relatively young, although he looks like he's had a bit of plastic surgery, doesn't he? He looks very strange here with the... Uh, makeup going on what is that is that 4k makeup good grief but honestly i have watched this trailer and it barely raised a chuckle with me you know if you want to watch vintage frasier just go back to the 90s era of watching that because that is some of the 11 or 12 years of best comedy along with friends that i've ever watched and it can't be replicated it can't be surpassed but the engagement rate on this trailer according to youtube analytics is very bad no one's asking or crying out for a revival of frasier which is why the cast of friends didn't want to return to those waters because why do you want to flog a dead horse to death? Because I love horses and you just don't do that to them. Ask Roach and the Witcher. But I will say this much. Why is David Hyde Pierce, fine actor that he is, not returning to reprise his role of Niles Crane? Because he simply said there's nothing more he can do with the role. It's a very subtle way of saying I don't really want to come back because the comedy is probably going to be very embarrassing. <laughs> Hello, my little oven-ready chickens. <laughs> you know, they have given me my own dressing room on this show. And it's next door to the one hot gossip ladies use. I have bored a little hole in the wall. I let them watch me. <laughs> oh, macho Marcel. <laughs> Au revoir, my beef burgers. <laughs> Uh, of course, something that does give me a complete massive stiffy is the trials and the tribulations 
of the Marvels film, which was once touted as a musical superhero film, and now it's, uh, well, what is it going to be? Well, I'll get to that part in a minute, but uh, this recent article from Bounding Into Comics, I can't believe what I'm seeing here. And I'm not surprised Hollywood is eating itself from the inside out like a succubus. Uh, after Vanity Fair claimed the Marvels clocked in with a $130 million budget, Forbes, who I'd actually trust over Vanity Fair, now shares the movie's budget is a whopping $274 million. What do woke points make? Woke prizes. What do points make? <laughs> Holy shit, this isn't even taking into account marketing, publicity, which you can't obviously do right now because of the sag after a strike. Oh God, I do love AI. I honestly do. You don't need to watch real actors anymore. Acting and films doesn't have that same appeal that it used to have for me back in the 60s, 70s and 80s and the 90s, of course. But... Oh, 274 million. You know what? When you take a fairly rookie director like Nia de Costa, who's obviously got left-leaning politics, of course things are going to spiral out of control, aren't they? It's not like someone like Danny Cannon, who was brought on to direct Judge Dredd with Sylvester Stallone, and the film came in at an estimated $90 million budget. Uh, but look at this, 274 million. What are you trying to cause correct Marvel? What are you hiding? Vanity Fair, I, I find this quite egregious from them because of course they would not do any research. They would happily sit there and go, oh yes, the budget for the Marvels is 130 million. That's relatively good, isn't it? By ho Jeeves. Shall we clink a glass of champagne and celebrate? But of course, leave it to Forbes to actually do some proper digging through because they've obviously got spies in Hollywood who can tell them these things. It is so absurd that a film that nobody had asked for when it should have been about the main character herself, Captain Marvel, not Captain Marvel and the faithful sidekicks because nobody's asking for an all-female ensemble superhero movie from Disney. If I want to watch anything like that, I'll watch Babes from Outer Space or Space Babes from Another Planet. You know, I'd rather sit there and watch those B-movies because at least they're going to entertain me for different reasons. But if you think this was bad, and I mean, what? Indiana Jones and the Dial of Diarrhea was how much? 300 million plus dollars? Good grief, but it only gets worse, folks. Uh, yes, there's a part two to this story. Nia da Costa unsurprisingly plays the racism and sexism card in the promotion of the Marvels. Well, Miss da Costa, I hope somebody shows you my channel one day because you'll quite clearly see I don't give a shit about any of those two particular subject matters because I just don't. <laughs> uh, speaking with Vanity Fair, oh, not again. <laughs> da Costa said, Sometimes, as a black woman, you realize that people think you take up more space than you actually do, or your voice sounds louder to people than it actually is, or your tone is more stern than it actually is. Love, actually. Funny enough, she's not wrong, because growing up and in my teens and into my twilight years working, I came across many a black woman who did exactly what Miss DeCosta is saying here. They've got to be the loudest one in the room. They've got to wear the loudest clothing. They have to put on so much overpowering perfume that you want to go into a toilet and gag your reflexes out. DeCosta added that some crew members, so this is all alleged by the way, on previous sets she worked on said things that are super inappropriate that you would just never say to anyone else because they were so specific to my race, gender, and my age. Oh dear God. While it did not provide any... <laughs> I said it. I, mis I misgendered Mr. Costa. I'm so sorry. While he did not... 
provide any examples or name any names. I'm cold reading this for the first time, folks. Uh, Vanity Fair's Becky Ford made it clear none of this happened on the set of the Marvels. She said, we had a very different experience working on that movie. Unfortunately, in part because she had the power to hire the people she wanted for her team. DaCosta said, I realized it wasn't ever going to be about how much power I amassed or how many great movies I made. You haven't made any great movies, Mr. Costa. What the fuck are you talking about? Or if I won awards, it was always just going to be the people that I surrounded myself with. What do you mean? Black folks? No white or Hispanic or Indian folks? Chinese? Just black folk, is it? She added, the thing that I've been most surprised by lately is how much respect I'm getting from these middle-aged white dudes that I work with. Oh gosh, the beauty of cold reading an article. Holy shit. The middle-aged white dude is something that Brie Larson said a few years ago. I do not need a 40-year-old white dude to tell me what didn't work for him about A Wrinkle in Time. It wasn't made for him. What is it with middle-aged white men? Are they supposed to be toxic? Are they supposed to step in line? What about middle-aged black dude? I mean, how do, what do they compare to a middle-aged white dude? What's the difference? I'm curious. Not only did DaCosta play the racism and sexism card, but she also appeared to distance herself from the film by claiming it was actually Marvel Studios exec Kevin Feige's mess. DaCosta discussed the advice she received from Black Panther director Ryan Coogler, and now a one-hit wonder, about just being herself when she was initially tapped to direct the film. So being herself is, um, you know, the complexion. She recalled, you can't do anything but be yourself. So bring that to the table. They can choose to take some and leave some, but that's what your job is. Wise words, Mr. Costa. You might try to heed the advice at some point in your life. In fact, later in the expose, Vanity Fair's Ford noted the film's post-production proved to be the most challenging, given the film needed to connect with the Ms. Marvel Disney series, which only three people watched, as well as the future of the MCU. If this film could punch any lower, it will miss my balls by a long shot. So on that one, ladies and gentlemen, what can I say? That was an absolutely fun-packed edition of the cringe apocalypse. Woo! Russell Brand, <laughs> fake crocodile tears. Um, you know what? He's going to get his money back on YouTube at some point. It will happen. Of course, it's going to happen. Uh, and he'll get away with murder just like Jimmy Savile thought he could. And then, well, he got found out and now he's uh, pissed and shat on six feet under. And yeah, the return of Frasier, not really expecting anything more, but you know what? The glorious mess that is the Marvels from a studio where even the return of Daredevil has been called a scam, but uh, well, not by Disney, but by an ex-showrunner or writer from the original Netflix Daredevil. He said what Disney are doing now is just a massive scam for the Daredevil Born Again storyline, which I won't be... Well, actually, I will watch it because I want to see if John Bernthal as the Punisher actually has to ask people he's about to assassinate what their preferred pronoun is. I think that would be absolutely hysterical. And John Bernthal was a very based man. So on that one, ladies and gentlemen, if you were me, and if I were you, and thank you very much to my new subscribers, you are the absolute best. You better come back for the next video. Oh, feeling sad? Then get your happy pill. Watch Jason King. Hail to the king, baby.